All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I know there are no classrooms right now, so all of you are joining at home. We've got some live teachers, some live families joining us today from across New Jersey and Ontario, so a huge welcome to them as well. Uh, but yes, over the last month and a half, we have done over 140 broadcasts featuring scientists, explorers, and facilities around the globe. And so we so appreciate you tuning in on YouTube to keep us company. So today, we are back at the Toronto Zoo, and they have been doing two programs every single week at 11 a.m. Eastern uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, featuring all sorts of amazing stories from across the zoo. Today, they are back, and they're going to walk us through the America's Pavilion, learning a little bit about hiding in plain sight with camouflage. So in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ellen at the zoo. I just want to make a quick note for anyone on YouTube. You can also use our Slido app. I'll link this in the YouTube chat bar. Take part in some interactive quizzes, upvote your favorite questions and more. The event code is CAMO today. But without further ado, the reason you're all here is for our speaker. We are joined live by Mary Ellen at the Toronto Zoo in the America's Pavilion. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, Mary Ellen, and take us away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. Hello, everyone, and welcome this is your first time and welcome back if you've been with us here before. I know we were talking earlier, there's definitely a few familiar uh, faces out there in the crowds today. Um, I'm so excited to be having you guys here with us at the Toronto Zoo. We are currently closed to the public, but that does not mean that we have stopped caring for the 5,000 animals that call our zoo their home. So we have keepers here every day, lots of staff coming in, uh, social distancing, but making sure that all of our animals have all the proper care that they need for this struggling time. So I'm very excited to have us in the America's Pavilion, like Jesse was saying. Um, we're gonna learn about camouflage today, but before we do, we've got our tradition now. We are gonna learn what our riddle of the day is. So in a second, oop, if I don't drop it here on us, um, we're gonna learn what the riddle is. I'll give you a hint, and if you get the answer right, it will be something I say today throughout one of our talks. Um, you can put it in the Slido chat bar or in the YouTube chat bar, and if you get it first, Jesse will give you a shout out at the end of the video. So our riddle today is staying hidden is my game, one with my habitat because we look the same. Look way up high or way down low, either way, you'll never know. And I'm gonna give you a hint. It's not gonna be like one specific animal or uh, like it's never gonna be turtle or snake or anything like that. It's going to be a behavior or an adaptation or some creature feature that a bunch of animals all share together um, and I will be saying it at some point during our video. So listen up today as we walk around. All right, so we're going to get started here. Like Jesse was saying, we're going to learn about camouflage, or as I like to say, how animals play hide and seek in the wild. So there's a couple different reasons that an animal might camouflage. Uh, they're mostly trying to mimic, or sorry, they're trying to uh, mask their location, their identification, or any movement. And that's based on a couple different reasons. So we're going to see some animals today who are really good at camouflage, and then some who are the exact opposite. They stand out like a sore thumb in nature, and we're gonna learn why they might do that and why it's beneficial for them. So there's a couple different ways that animals can camouflage, um, and some of those have dependence, so they're, they're not always the best at it when they start out. And these can be things like the age or the sex of an animal, so sometimes a male versus a female in animal world, they can look different from each other. Think of a peacock, the boys are that bright blue color and the girls are more of a brown color. That's called sexual dimorphism. Um, so there's differences between sex. Uh, there's also difference between behavior and the abilities for uh, a predator. So if you are an animal, it depends on what your predator is able to see or detect, will influence the camouflage you have. We have a little diagram for that right here. We've talked in previous videos about eyes on front versus eyes on side for animals. So if you're a predator and your eyes are on the front of your face, you have really good vision facing forward, but not maybe the best peripheral vision. But if you are a prey, like our bunny here, your front vision isn't that good, but your peripheral vision is pretty good. So you're looking for movement here and you're looking for identification here. So depending on how well the predators coming after you are, that's gonna change what your camouflage is going to be and how it'll help you survive. Another key aspect of that is animal coatings. So last week, if you remember, we talked about animal coverings and classification in the Rainforest Pavilion. You can go back on the Explore by the Seed of Your Pants YouTube page if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and we talked about how feathers and scales and fur help change an animal, or help uh, allow animals to survive. This also helps them with their camouflage. 
So as we come down here, we can see animals who have scales. So animals like snakes, I have a rattlesnake behind me here. They are able to shed their full skin uh, every couple of weeks, depending on their age. So they can change their slight coloration a little bit easier. Same thing for animals like birds. So we have a feather here from a great horned owl. Feathers replace pretty quickly in birds. Um, so they're able to shed their old feathers if they're damaged or dirty, or molt them, sorry, and then they can grow in new ones that'll help with their camouflage. Animals like uh, Arctic fox and hares, uh, animals with fur, they have a little bit of a harder time. So this is actually an Arctic fox uh, fur here. Um, and you can see it's very white. It's quite beautiful. I wish you guys could feel it. It's very soft as well. Um, but this animal can't change its color or its camouflage at the drop of a hat. Often you'll see that our animals like Arctic foxes are um, white, really bright in the wintertime, but then in the summertime, they get a little bit darker, a little bit more brown in color, but this takes the entire season for them to change color. It does not happen in a couple of days or weeks like it would for the rattlesnake or for the snakes or the birds. So your camouflage also depends on the type of species you are and where you fall in the classification. All right, so our first animal we're gonna talk about here is actually a rattlesnake. And he's pretty good at camouflaging right now. Hopefully you guys can see him. He's just underneath of that uh, little tree there. So this is actually the only rattlesnake that we actually have here um, in Ontario. Um, and although I know it looks like he's blending in people, oh, I just noticed we have two of them here. I don't know if you guys can see this, actually one underneath of this house and our second one is underneath of this tree. I forgot we had two in here. Uh, so you can hopefully get a good glimpse of them. We're gonna see a couple more animals coming up who are also a venomous or poisonous animal. Um, and you're gonna notice that they look very different from this rattlesnake. These guys, they are venomous, um, but they blend in really well to their habitat and they camouflage, but they have a different technique uh, to help alert you to their venom or to their uh, venom and their danger. And that is their rattle that they have. So I actually have a rattle biofact right here. Pretty cool. Um, so while they are in their habitat, if they get scared or startled or frightened or anything like that, or they sense danger coming, they're gonna shake their tail and it gives us gives off this little hissing sound. Now, for a long time, we actually believed that there was a ball or something inside of their tail that made that rattle sound. But when we actually got the opportunity to cut one open, you uh, are able to see that it's actually just layers of skin or their scales on there. So every time they shed their scales, uh, the scales on their tail stay there and dry out. So the more they shed, the louder their rattle can be. Now we're talking about camouflage here. These guys are super good at camouflage. But if you hear this rattle in the wild, you're probably gonna wanna back away slowly and keep your eyes down on the ground to make sure you don't accidentally get near it. And there's other animals out there take advantage of this. So we're gonna get another close and zoom here on these guys. And I want you to take a look at their pattern and coloration. So these guys are called the uh, Massasauga rattlesnake, but there's two other snakes called the fox snake and the milk snake who actually look quite similar to these guys. They are not venomous though. These two types of snakes are constrictors. Um, an easy way that we tell constrictors a part here at the Toronto Zoo is we actually use our fingers to help us remember if, uh, the difference between constriction and venomous. So if a snake is venomous, we hold up a V and it has its two fangs that bite you. If a snake is a constrictor, we hold up a C and it squeezes in to kill you. So obviously in snake world, when it comes to these guys, a venomous snake is a little bit more dangerous uh, for their size than a constrictor snake is for us. So the snakes who mimic this snake are constrictors. So that means predators would want to eat them over the rattlesnake because they might die if they eat the rattlesnake. It might bite them with their venom. So they use mimicry to look and sound exactly like the rattlesnake. So they'll actually have a fake rattle and they'll try and scare you away from getting close to them. So that's just one form of camouflage that we can see in the animal kingdom. All right, we're going to keep going here. As we walk through, we're going to go through and see a couple of them tanks of uh, some of our other animals here at the zoo before we get to our next camouflage animal. So you'll get kind of a little uh, tour here of our America's pavilion. See some of our turtles. And we also have some really cool reptiles also in this tank. These guys are also experts in camouflage. Uh, most animals have at least some form of camouflage that they're able to use. Uh, but we're not going to stop and talk about these guys today. We have mentioned them though in previous videos. If you go back into Explore by the Sea Deer Pants 
YouTube channel, there's a Toronto Zoo playlist. You are able to see um, all the different tanks that we've looked at as we've been through the Americas Pavilion quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. Um, I know that when we were here for um, animal movement, Sean was talking about the electric field. Um, and we also spoke with some of our other animals. All right, so come on through. There we go. Now people are always uh, confused when we have doors inside of a building like this. And that's because the area that we've just entered is actually a free flight area, which means there's birds up in the trees around us right now. These are really cool sections of the Toronto Zoo, but we do open back up. I encourage you to come and try and find them. There's one in every one of our pavilions, uh, where it's called a free flight aviary. So basically the birds are flying around you and you get to kind of interact with them um, in their habitat as well, which is kind of neat. All right, we're here at our next animal, so we're gonna try and get a close up on them. We've seen these guys here before. These are our American alligators. So we do here have two at the Toronto Zoo, um, the uh, male and female. The me, male is quite a bit bigger. That's again, that sexual dimorphism coming into play here, uh, the difference between the males and females. So alligator camouflage is kind of interesting. So these guys, it doesn't look like they have much going on for their camouflage, but a lot of it is under the surface for them. And that's kind of a pun intended. Uh, I don't know if you guys can tell on the video, but they are primarily underwater right now. They're really dark in color. Now we have clean water in their exhibit, but where they're found in parts of the world, it's usually pretty marshy and the water can be a little bit dark um, and dirty. So they actually blend in extremely well to the water and rocks around them. They are slow moving until they have to. So remember camouflage is like that, or, uh, masking identity, movement, or um, uh, yeah, identity and movement. So they're masking their movement with their camouflage. So as they go slowly through the water, they only have to bring the top part of their head above the water to see, breathe, and hear. And that's because they have something called streamlined senses. We'll have the camera pan back over to me for one more second here before we go back to them. Streamlined senses are kind of interesting. There's a lot of aquatic animals who have it. So basically, if you think the top of their head is like my hand here, their nose is here, their eyes are here, and their ears are here meaning only about an inch or so of their body needs to be above the water for all their senses to be active and working. Think about it in human terms. If I was trying to stay under the water, but I wanted to see, hear, and breathe still, I would need at least this much of my head to be above the water. And that would give away my location pretty easily. These guys on the other hand, they are able to stay so submerged underwater that they can sneak up on their prey and attack at the last second. And I know I mentioned that they're slow moving, but they are only slow until they wanna attack and then they can really move. If you've ever seen a nature documentary or anything like that, you can rarely see these guys before they pop up for their final attack. All right, we're gonna keep going to um, a very interesting part of the zoo over here. This is what I like to call the creepy crawly wing. Uh, there's a lot of insects and bugs and things like that. And, uh, you know, we have to love them all. We have to respect them all, but they still give me the heebie-jeebies for sure. Our first one we're gonna come up to, these guys are experts in uh, camouflage. So these are actually Brazilian cockroaches. So I was mentioning at the rattlesnakes that there's different ways that animals can camouflage. So we have mimicry. There's also uh, two other ways that uh, insects are really good at. So these guys are replicating the way where they just blend into their habitat. They just look like part of the tree. So they're using their brown coloration to blend into the world around them. Another great example of an insect who's able to camouflage is our stick bugs or stick insects. So I have a bio fact of some of them here. Zoom in on them there. So these are animals who can uh, use disguise. So they actually look like other animals in the world or look look other objects, sorry. So these guys look like sticks. You'll also see a lot of animals, if you come back to our zoo when we're open, in the Australasia Pavilion, we have some more insects in there and they actually look like leaves. Um, so they're uh, kind of like crispy looking, kind of like a burnt potato chip, and they actually sway ever so slightly. And you can see them in their exhibit, they rock back and forth. And for the insects, they're actually mimicking wind blowing through a tree on the leaves. So they're trying so hard to look like a leaf blowing in the wind that they'll rock back and forth ever so slightly. 
is pretty cool. All right, we're going to keep going this way and we're going to check out a few more of our uh, amazing panels. Okay, through our doors. And it looks like we're also going to get a sneak peek here at our lovely otters. The last couple of times we've been in here, our otters have been uh, sleeping on us, but it looks like they're pretty active right now. So we'll stay here for a quick second just because I know we've missed out on seeing them the last couple of videos. These guys are super playful. They are American river otters. We do have two sets of otters here at the Toronto Zoo. So when you come back, when we're open, we have river otters here in Americas. And we also have spotted necked otters in the African Rainforest Pavilion. All right, I know they're super cute, but we're gonna keep coming over here to our next tank. So at the rattlesnake, I was talking about how there's a difference between a venomous and a, a poisonous animal. So we've mentioned this in videos before, but if you, uh, have a venomous or a poisonous animal in front of you. Um, don't actually do this, but the way to think about it, to tell the, them apart, to see which one's venomous and which one's poisonous. Um, if the animal bites you and you die, you, it was venomous. If you eat the animal and you die, it was poisonous. So poison you have to ingest and venom you have to inject. So I'm just trying to find here a good angle for you guys. Hopefully you can see a couple of our poison dart frogs. There's two in the back, there's a blue one and a yellow one there. Hopefully you guys are able to see them on our video. So I talked about the rattlesnake that a venomous or poisonous animal wants you to know that they are there. So the rattlesnake uses their rattle. These guys have bright colors. So they stand out, that blue and yellow are pretty uh, bright and noticeable in the animal kingdom. There are a couple of them in here. So we'll try and find a few more for you guys to see. Oh, there's another blue one in the back there as well. So this bright color on an animal, if you think about it, if you're driving on the highway or you're driving around your neighborhood and you see a bright orange sign on the road, it probably means that there's construction up ahead and you have to be careful of driving because there's now a blockage or an obstacle in the road in front of you. So think about these animals exactly like a danger or yield sign on a highway. So their bright colors are telling their predators, um, hey, I'm here, you don't wanna accidentally eat me, um, because I am going to probably kill you, or in some cases, taste really, really, really bad. So there's another blue one there in front of us. Now to give you an idea of some of our other uh, toads here, these are Puerto Rican crested toads. And these guys probably taste pretty good to predators. He's just at the back there. He actually looks like a rock. So this is again, that type of camouflage. He's staying really still. He's trying to mask his movement and mask his identification. He is not poisonous. He is not venomous. Um, and he does not want to be eaten. So he doesn't want anybody to know he's there. All right, we're gonna keep coming up this way, but before we go to see our next animal, who's also quite skilled at camouflage, I'm just gonna let everybody know we're walking into a bit of a bunker in this pavilion. So our signal might drop for a couple seconds, uh, but I promise you we'll be right back and we will, uh, get talking again in just a second. So we're gonna look at some of our animals as we walk up here. There are piranha again, and hopefully our signal shouldn't get too bad for us. It's been great, Mary Ellen. And as we're looking at animals, uh, I know you've mentioned it a few times, but for everyone tuning in live on YouTube or directly with us, uh, we've done over 10 programs at the Toronto Zoo over the last month and a half, two months. So do check those out. Some really, really great stuff on our playlist. And I have linked it into the chat bar too. Thanks, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So we're at our next animal here. And we've talked about this guy before as well. This is actually our octopus that we have here in the America's Pavilion. Um, he is up in our corner right now. So when you come to the zoo, people are always like, I never saw an octopus. It's because they're so good at camouflaging that they're quite hard to see in their exhibit. Uh, so always look up in the corners for ours. That's usually where he likes to hide. Um, these guys use camouflage for two different reasons. So uh, speaking beforehand, about animals camouflaging themselves to protect themselves from predators. The octopus definitely does that. They will be camouflaged so that nothing can come find them or eat them or if they get startled. Um, but they also use it to hunt. Uh, we're gonna meet another snake in a second who also uses this tactic as well. Uh, but basically they will camouflage in and sit and wait for their food to swim by or move by them in some form. And then they will lash out and attack. So they're trying to conceal their identification as well as their movement so that they can have a successful hunt. 
So these guys, like I said, have, are really good at camouflaging and they can actually change their color and their texture of their skin. Now this is a little bit of a complicated process. So to kind of put it in simple terms, uh, they have color changing cells. So these are called uh, coral morphins and they are basically just below the surface of their skin and they're responsible for uh, these transformations that they have. So by flexing and using their muscles, they are able to show different levels of pigment as they uh, move through the water, which is quite cool. All right, so we're gonna keep going up this way. And like I said, we're gonna meet another animal who uses that wait and sit technique, or we call it an ambush technique. Uh, so they're not really actively hunting their prey, they're waiting for their prey to come to them. So our next one here is actually our boa constrictor, right down here on the ground. And you might be able to tell by its name how it actually uh, catches its food. We mentioned at the rattlesnake, there's a difference between being a constrictor and being a venomous snake. This is a constrictor snake, which means uh, when it gets close enough to you and it strikes out at you in order to kill its prey, um, it will give it a nice, nice, really tight hug for an extended period of time. Um, and that hug will eventually cause suffocation for the prey. Now, the two different types of snakes we've seen today, our rattlesnake and our uh, boa here, they are both terrestrial snakes. So they're ground dwelling snakes, which means when they wanna blend in, they look like their environment. So they're gonna look like the ground around them. But we have lots of different snakes here in the Toronto Zoo. And some of our snakes are what we call arboreal, meaning they like to live up in the trees. One of those snakes is actually a green tree python. Unfortunately, I only have a cool photo of them here. This is actually one of our green tree pythons. Uh, when you come back to the zoo and we've opened back up, you can see them in the Australasia Pavilion. But you'll notice a pretty striking difference of the coloration of this python to this boa constrictor. And that is that this guy is entirely green. So I mentioned he's living up in trees. So he is camouflaging to his habitat around him. So like I was saying earlier on, what changes camouflage in animals is their species, their surroundings, where they like to live. So not all snakes camouflage in the same way. All right, our next animal, we keep coming over this way. There we go, let's see if we can get a good angle on one of them. So these are our spectacled owls. Uh, they get that name because when you can get a close up on one of them here, uh, you might be able to tell that their uh, eyes actually look like they're wearing glasses. There we go. Hopefully we'll get a, a good look at them. There. Sometimes these guys are hard to see. We'll keep moving There is a second one over here. So owls are experts at camouflage. Um, and this is because of their feathers and their coloration, but also their ability to be still and their ability to move their head around as well. So a lot of people always get this confused as well. How far can an owl turn their head around? I actually have my uh, baseball cap here with me as well. Um, to show you guys a little diagram of how far an owl can turn their head. All right, so if this is an owl looking forward, so the front of my hat is like the beak or the face, an owl can go this way, this way, and this way with one turn, and then they can go the opposite direction the same way, but they cannot go all the way around. It's about 270 degrees they can turn their head. And by doing this, they're able to keep their body nice and still and then turn their head out and about uh, just to see what's going on around them. Uh, but animals like a great horned owl, we actually have one in this pavilion uh, just outside. If you come to the Toronto Zoo again, when we are open, you might actually have a hard time finding them if they're near a tree because they blend in so well. Now these guys here, they have another cool kind of um, adaptation that you can use for camouflage. Uh, they don't necessarily take advantage of as much, but their coloration does help us uh, get the idea in the picture. So looking at our spectacled owl right now, you can see that she has a uh, lighter belly and a darker coat around her back. So she's brown on her back and she's kind of a yellowy white color on her chest or on her front. Here's a couple other examples of some animals that also have this type of coloration. We've actually seen, this is a puzzle. She's one of our tree kangaroos that we have here at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, we met her when we were in our Australasia Pavilion in a previous video. This is also one of our penguins that we have here at the Toronto Zoo. So you'll notice in their photos that they have dark backs and light tummies. And this type of camouflage is actually called counter shading. 
And it's really important for species of animals who can have attacks from underneath of them and above them at the same time. So think about it in terms of a penguin when they're swimming in the water, a large fish or something like that, or a shark might be able to come up and get them from underneath of them, but also a really large bird might be able to predate them from the top as well. So that white belly helps them to blend in with the sky above them and their dark back helps them to blend in with the water underneath of them. These guys can use those same principles. So that's called counter shading. That's their type of camouflage. All right, we're gonna head over to our last animal just over here before we move to our question and answer period. And these guys are always very excited to see us. We've talked about them before in previous videos as well. These are our golden lion tamperins. So we have a whole family of these guys here behind me. Um, and we talked about, you know, bright colors mean that they're poisonous or venomous. Well, there's always exceptions to those rules. These guys are neither, they are not poisonous, they are not venomous, uh, but those bright colors can actually help them spot each other in the darker levels of their canopy. So wherever they live, the jungle is very dense. So there's a lot of trees and uh, coverage around them. So sometimes it can get a little dark, but also a predator who's looking below at them and looking up at them might mistake them for the sun or maybe a piece of fruit hanging from one of the trees as well. So that's their main type of camouflage is they kind of try and blend into their surroundings around them. Alrighty guys, that has brought us to the end of our camouflage talk here in the America's Pavilion. Jesse, I'm gonna throw it back to you. We'll see if anybody got our riddle answer um, and then we'll go to question and answers. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for an awesome presentation as always, Mary Ellen. Um, we did get someone get the answer at the very end. You said it in our owl section. So the young animator on YouTube, counter shading is our answer to a riddle, not camouflage. No matter how many times you guys write camouflage, you definitely <laughs> get the right answer, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> so we're about to dive in with Q&A. There's a whole bunch of you that have typed in questions on Slido. That's fantastic. We're going to take a bunch of those. You can also share questions on YouTube and we'll come to our live groups as well. I'm gonna start us with our, our top question today on Slido from Andreas, and that is, what is the alligator's main food? Okay, so what is the alligator's main food? So uh, there is a difference for food for a lot of our uh, big animals versus like in-captivity versus in the wild. Um, so here at the Toronto Zoo, uh, our primary uh, meat that our animals are getting is uh, horse meat. Um, it's very lean meat for them. It works well. It's very, it mimics their natural meat as close as possible. Um, so they'll be getting horse meat. They're also probably going to be getting some live animals. So we give like chicks, uh, mice, rats, quails, that kind of thing to our big carnivores. They get those on a variety of different days. Um, they're in the wild. Our alligators are probably going to be um, going after large fish, uh, small mammals, anything they can kind of get to on the banks of rivers and marshes and things like that. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary Ellen. All right, we're going to go to Andrew and Abigail and Markham. If you guys want to kick us off with a live question, you're demuted. Go for it. Yes. Do basilisk lizards climb? Ooh, basilisk lizards. So, Mary Ellen, did you catch that? Um, no. Could you repeat that, Jesse? Yeah, so basilisk lizards, the ones that run across water, can they climb as well or not? Do we know? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to come back to that one, if you don't mind. Um, we'll check back in with that one in just a minute. Perfect. Fantastic, guys. We'll get you that answer in just a second. All right, let's head to Linda in Ocean City, New Jersey, and her group. Hi, guys. Do you have any questions? Okay. What animal that you haven't, what camouflage animal that you haven't seen before that you want to see the most? Ooh, okay. Oh, so an animal that I haven't seen before? Yeah, that you'd like to see the very most that's camouflaged. Maybe you did see it and you just didn't know. Well, she's not really that camouflage. It's, it's a little bit, but I'll tell you guys a quick story. Um, we have gone to our Australasia Pavilion and hopefully we'll go there in the future as well during these videos and I can point her out if I ever find her. But there is one animal at the Toronto Zoo that I have never seen before. I've been here for about five years now. Her name is Annie and she is an echidna. She lives in our Australasia Pavilion, uh, the same uh, enclosure as our wombats do. We met them a couple weeks ago. And she is uh, an animal who kind of looks like a porcupine and a platypus had a baby. So she kind of looks like a platypus in the front and then she's got these spikes in behind. Um, and she does blend into her habitat very well. Because of this though, and the time of day that she likes to be awake, I have yet to ever see her. 
five years I have been here and I have not seen any the echidna. So she is my dream animal to see. Every time I walk by that her pavilion, I stand there and try and find her, but I have yet to accomplish that goal. Cool. I love stories like that. That's fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Mary Ellen. By the way, for Andrew and Abigail, just looked it up. From birth, basilisk lizards are able to run. Or, sorry, able to climb. They're able to run, too. They can run, they can climb, they can do it all. Just wanted to let Perfect. you Perfect. Know. Thank you. All right. Uh, Genevieve in Oshawa, who has consistently been asking, like, the top questions on Slido all month long. So thanks for that, Genevieve. She wanted to know, what is a rattlesnake's rattle made of? Yeah, for sure. So I wish I had my bio fact here, but we actually left it at the other end of the pavilion. Um, but a rattlesnake's rattle is actually made of their shed skin coming off or their shedded scales. Uh, so basically every time they grow and snakes will shed their scales at different levels throughout their life. So a baby snake is going to shed more frequently than an adult snake will because it's trying to grow. And every time they're growing, they need to shed off that old layer of scales. And every time they do, it gathers around their tail. And so when they rattle, what you're actually hearing is all the dead layers of their scales uh, shifting against each other, which is really cool. Once they're older, snakes really only will shed their scales if they have damage to them and they need to clean them off and get a new layer underneath. Fantastic. All right. Um, I'm going to come to some more Slido questions in a minute, but I want to come back to Elena's group. Uh, joining us in New Jersey as well. If you guys have a question, oh, let's mute your mic. Wants to work. Let's see. You're good to go. Yes, go for it. Why might an animal be camouflaged instead of poisonous? Ah, good question. Oh, okay, so why might an animal be camouflaged instead of poisonous? So not every animal is lucky enough to be poisonous or venomous as a defense mechanism for them. Uh, some of them are really tasty to the animals that are living around them. And so they have to use camouflage to try and survive in their habitats. So take, for example, our poison dart frog and our Puerto Rican crested toads we were looking at earlier. The poison dart frogs actually get their poison from the food that they eat. So um, if you've ever been in Ontario, I'm pretty sure they're in other places in the world as well. We have red ants or fire ants, they're often called. Uh, they are very painful when you get bitten by them. They'll swarm on you um, and they leave these bites that really hurt. Poison dart frogs actually eat those ants and they use the uh, bite, the fire bite that the ants have and turn it into their own poison. So they actually use it from another animal. Whereas the Puerto Rican crested toads, they don't have any ability like that to create poison. So they have to camouflage by looking like a rock or something still in their exhibit or their habitat to avoid being eaten instead. Super cool. All right. Uh, a question I figured we'd be getting. Natalia on slide, I want to know how many different kinds of uh, animals at the Toronto Zoo are able to camouflage? So I would say, and this could be argued in either direction, but every single animal probably in the world is able to have some sort of camouflaged abilities. So I was talking at the beginning, they're camouflaging uh, for, um, to mask their movement or their identification. So camouflage doesn't necessarily have to be just that coloration that blends them into their background. Um, animals who have spots or stripes, those things tend to stick out to us as humans. But that's because our eyesight is different. So for other animals in their habitat, um, they might be harder to spot. There's a great example of this is the snow leopard. They're a spotted animal. So if you're just looking at a photo of a snow leopard, they look like they would stand out in any kind of habitat. But if you actually Google snow leopards camouflaging, I bet you'll have a very difficult time actually spotting the animal in the photo because their spots actually disappear into their background as well. So it depends on the context of where an animal is, kind of makes the camouflage work for them or not work for them. But I would say every animal has some level of camouflage as a defense, either to stop them from being eaten or to help them eat something else. Very cool. Thanks, Mary Ellen. For people interested in snow leopards too, we actually did a program about two months ago with a woman named Charlotte Hacker who studies snow leopards in China and shows some pictures of snow leopards blending into the background there. It's incredible. So I encourage you to check that out on our YouTube channel. All right, I want to go to Miss Reynolds' class. Uh, so Miss Reynolds is joining us live at home and she's going to share a question to one of her students. So Miss Reynolds, uh, if you have a question, go for it. 
Oh, I'm sorry. None of my students have uh, logged in to ask a question. No <laughs> so I, I've been constantly checking. No worries. Well, thanks for being here anyway. And I, what I'll do is I'll go to Ms. Schroeder's class then. Uh, Ms. Schroeder, if you have a question from your students, go for it. Let's see. Um, nope. No. Okay. That's okay. Well, welcome in. Glad you're joining us anyway. Um, what I'll do that is, um, let me take another question from Slido. So you told us that owls can turn their heads 270 degrees. How fast can they turn them? So they, can they whip it around really quick or do they have to go slowly or how does it work, Mary Ellen? Yeah, for sure. So they can move their heads pretty quickly. Um, they are able to like move it faster than I could basically. So if you think about how fast you can move your head comfortably side to side, um, they're able to turn their head basically to its extreme pretty quickly. Um, and they, like I said, they can't go past that about 270 degrees. Um, and then they can go all the way back the other direction as well if they need it. But it is a pretty quick motion. Uh, like I said, if you come check out our great horned owl, um, it seems to be like you disturb him from a nap sometimes and he'll be walking up to his exhibit and you're like, oh, where is he? I can't find him. And all of a sudden he whips his head out at you glares you down for a second and then whips his head back around and camouflages back to the tree. So it's definitely quite quick when they move. Fantastic. All right, we're gonna take a few more questions today, people. By the way, uh, just quickly, I know we might've mentioned it when we got here. What animals are we checking out right now, Mary Ellen? So we are looking at our golden lion tamarins here. So they're a type of small primate that live in uh, South America. Very cool. We Again, we've done the America's Pavilion a couple other times in this program. So if you wanna check out more on our, our primates in this area, uh, I encourage you to do that. All our sessions are live. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, a bunch of people on Slido are asking about poison dart frogs and how deadly they are. So if you touch a poison dart frog, would you die or what would happen to you? <laughs> um, all right. So we, well, first of all, just to introduce you guys, we're going to switch primates here. So now we're looking at our common marmosets instead. There's three of them in this exhibit. Well, their main exhibit is getting clean. So there's one of them right there. Um, so Poison and venom take different effects on different animals. And I mentioned at the poison dart frogs, um, you have to ingest poison for it to be uh, deadly for you in any capacity or, or um, hurt you in any way. Uh, but there's different levels. So venom and poison, there's different types of them. So some of them uh, can make you uh, feel nauseous or sick. Some of them could uh, stop your blood from being able to clot. And some of them could be like a neurotoxin. So it depends on the species and what level their venom is at. And it also depends on you. So if you consider this, I am an adult human. I'm six feet tall. Um, so I'm above average in that kind of like body scale. So the same thing that might affect me would be different than let's say a six-year-old human child. Um, so it depends on your age, your overall health, um, and then also the animal and how much you actually ingest. So for a poison dart frog, you probably get pretty sick, but for those guys, you probably wouldn't have a death for someone like me. I don't recommend that you go in and start licking all creatures in the world. It's <laughs> definitely not something we condone here. Um, you wanna make sure you leave nature be, uh, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, but if you ever do find yourself in a situation like that, it's always best to seek help. Uh, places like the Toronto Zoo and other accredited facilities around, if you have any venomous snakes or anything like that, you also have to have the antidote for it. So in case one of our keepers, we work really, really hard to make sure that they don't have to come in contact with our snakes uh, who are venomous or any of our poisonous animals. We have lots of protocols and devices that help us maintain a barrier between us and them. But if something were to ever to happen to us or somebody out in the public, um, we have to be able to make sure that we can help them in that situation as well. Fantastic. I love it. Straight from the Toronto Zoo, do not go out and start licking animals. That is a good lesson from all our programs. Um, I'm going to go to Ms. Schroeder for one last question before we wrap up. So Ms. Schroeder, if you uh, have one now, take us away. Yes, see, we have a student named Audrina, and she would like to know how old do alligators get? Oh, okay, so how old can an alligator get? That's good. Oh, it looks like we have our keeper in here joining us as well right now into the exhibit. They're coming in to do a little cleaning uh, for our uh, our animals. So maybe we'll pop back over to the other exhibit here while we're answering this final question, just to make sure that we don't uh, feature them if they don't want to be featured in our video. So um, we've mentioned in videos uh, past as well, uh, a lifespan for each animal can be uh, different depending if they're living in the wild versus um, in captivity. For alligators though, they prob 
roughly, I'd say between 40 to 50 years, maybe 35 to 50 years, um, if they are able to, uh, you know, find their food, be healthy, uh, not get attacked or anything like that. Once they get to full size, other alligators really only have to worry about other alligators trying to take over their space. Uh, so once they get to full size, they're pretty safe in their habitats. Um, in captivity, though, as well, there are quite a few species who can benefit from medical care. Uh, later this week on Thursday, we're actually going to be going through our wildlife health center and learning a little bit more about how we're able to help prolong and extend the life of many animals and make their uh, existence here at the Toronto Zoo a happier and healthier place for them as well. Fantastic. Mary Ellen, I think that we are at the time where I want to ask our final question, which is for kids tuning in live, for people tuning in on YouTube, where can they go to find more about all the awesome stuff you guys are doing in education at the zoo, even though you guys aren't open to public right now? That's perfect. That's one of the best questions. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you guys can keep learning. If you go to the Toronto Zoo uh, website and you go under parent and educator resources, there's going to be three main tabs for you where you can uh, look up different resources that we have that relate to these videos, as well as some general ones to help promote different education. They're all curriculum based and linked. Uh, we also do have our new live gorilla cam, which has just gone up as well. So you can check that out. Uh, take a look at our gorillas in their habitat. Uh, see what they like to do and what they get up to during their day. And I believe at around 10 a.m. they're going to be getting a new enrichment every day, so you can check that out. We do also have uh, lots of social media, so you can come see on us at Instagram, Facebook, even TikTok. I know we do have one of those as well. It's just at the Toronto Zoo for all of them. Um, and at, every day at 1 o'clock, uh, our time here in uh, Toronto, we are doing a live keeper talk on Facebook Live at the Toronto Zoo uh, Facebook account as well. Amazing. Well, thank you so, so much, Mary Ellen, for an amazing presentation today. And in addition to those resources, which I have linked into the YouTube chat bar, check us out on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. All our past sessions are on our YouTube channel. You can check us out on social media. And if you want to donate for what we're doing for digital education, go on to our website. We so appreciate you tuning in. And Mary Ellen, what we do at the end of every broadcast, as you know, is I'm going to denude all our live groups and families today. So Elena, Andrew, uh, Ms. Reynolds, Emily, all you guys, you are all demuted. If you want to join me in saying a huge thank you to Mary Ellen and the Toronto Zoo team, go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. You're welcome. Thanks very Thanks much, very guys. Much. <laughs> we so appreciate you guys tuning in. For everyone on YouTube, do check us out. We look forward to having you back soon. And Mary Ellen, have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye, Jesse. All right. Bye for now, everyone. See you soon.